How's it going everyone? It's Chow here and today we are going to talk a little bit about atmospheric circulation patterns as well as prevailing winds. For some reason this is sort of a concept that gets a lot of people um, so I'm gonna go through and hopefully after this short video you will have a much better understanding of it and won't be as confused by it. So let's get started. Okay. So first of all, let's establish the fact that it's the tilt of the Earth's axis that causes varied seasons. That's something that you probably would know at this point, so it's just something to kind of point out. But the tilt of the axis affects the surface area of solar radiation that the Earth receives. So for example, at the equator you have more direct rays, which ultimately means more intense rays of sunlight and solar radiation. On the other hand, in areas away from the equator, for instance at the North Pole, there's going to be less direct rays, and as a result, the amount of solar radiation is going to be scattered across the greater surface area, and obviously as a result, it's not going to be as intense. So the equator gets the most direct rays, it also has the most intense rays, and as a result, it gains the most solar energy. And then as you move away from the equator, you get less and less of that available solar energy. And this is all due to the tilt of the Earth's axis, which ultimately can also contribute to variations in the seasons. So this is the flow chart that is very important for our understanding of ecology in a general broad realm scheme. So what's really fascinating here is that it all starts at the sun. So the sun produces solar energy. The solar energy is going to trigger atmospheric circulation patterns. In addition, the earth is going to be rotating. So the atmospheric circulation patterns plus earth's rotation is what's actually going to cause and, and make the, uh, the prevailing winds. The prevailing winds ultimately then cause ocean currents, which then drive variations in distributions of climate, which of course then drives organisms to adapt to those local abiotic conditions, and that's what causes our biomes. But here we're really focusing in on sort of circulation patterns and um, prevailing winds, which for some reason is a topic that gets a lot of people, so we're gonna, just going to look into it and hopefully you'll get a better understanding. Okay, so at the equator, at zero, degrees, uh, at zero degrees over here, the solar radiation is going to be at the most intense. So the solar radiation is going to heat up this air around the equator, and as the, hair, the air gets heated, it's going to rise. And so heated air rises from the surface of the planet up into the upper atmospheric levels, until it reaches such a high elevation that it cools. When it cools, the air can't really hold moisture anymore. So it cools, condenses, and because it can't hold moisture very well, it's going to ultimately release that moisture as rain, at least in the equator. And so this is the reason why there's so much rain at the equator, and this is why we see rainforests at the equator. So this is the first step. Hopefully it makes a lot of sense. Um, if it doesn't, try and think about it and process it. Now what's really fascinating is that most deserts are actually located at 30 degrees north of the equator or 30 degrees south of the equator. And this is because when the air is heated, it rises. And after it rises, it cools and condenses and rains. So the moisture is going to be raining back down near the equator. Once the air moves up into higher elevations, it's ultimately going to cool, and then that's going to rain. After the air has lost its moisture from rain, it descends 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south. And so what happens here is we produce a low pressure system at the equator, which means there's going to be a greater possibility of precipitation. Whereas once that air is cooled, condensed, and now it's precipitating and there's rain, it loses that moisture and it moves, let's just say 30 degrees north here. It moves 30 degrees north and it presses back down on the planet at the 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south of the equator. 
when the air when the air descends it's going to be it already has lost all of its moisture here at the equator so it's going to be very dry air that and the fact that the air is pressing down and moving down on the planet it's going to create a high pressure system which further decreases the chance of any sort of precipitation in addition, that dry air, as it's moving down, it's going to either deflect even further north or deflect back to the south. And as a result, that dry air might actually even take more moisture from this region at 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south, and that further depletes this region of water. So as a result of these, this combination of these characteristics, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south is extremely dry, and that is often where we see our dry deserts, which is shown over here. So our deserts, our hot deserts, uh, often are, sh are often located around 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south. So you can see like the Atacama Desert, that's 30 degrees south. Now you can see the Sonoran Desert or the Sahara Desert, which is 30 degrees north. And this is, again, part of the reason why deserts occur at those locations. So that's something that's very important, and you should definitely think about why that's the case. If you understand why deserts are located at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, and what causes that, then you're set. In addition, know why there are rainforests and heavy rainstorms at the equator. And once you know that, then you're even better off. Okay. So now this is just happening in a situation where the Earth isn't rotating. So the air is just going back up and down, up and down, up and down. But the Earth is actually rotating, so the air is going to be slightly deflected. So what's really fascinating is that the velocity of the Earth's rotation is the fastest at the equator. This is just simply physics. The air mass, in addition, is not moving in either direction if, oh, so if the air mass is not moving in either direction, it has the same velocity as the Earth. But if the air mass is moving away from the equator, it is actually moving faster than Earth and is deflected to the east. If the air mass is moving toward the equator and is slower, it's going to be slower than the Earth underneath it, and therefore it's going to be deflected to the west. This is very confusing. Um, if you want to learn the physics behind it, great. Otherwise, just memorize it, and that might be something that can potentially help you. So the velocity, again, the velocity of the Earth's rotation is the, fa is the fastest at the equator. The air mass is not moving in either direction. It is the same velocity as the Earth underneath it, which makes sense. And then, of course, if the air mass is moving away from the equator, it is going to be faster than the Earth and is deflected to the east. And if the air mass is moving towards the equator, it is going to be slower than the Earth and is going to be deflected to the west. So ultimately, we create these prevailing winds like this from the Coriolis effect. With the Earth rotating in this direction, as shown here, these air patterns are not just going to be going up and down or up, up and down. So the circulation patterns aren't just things that are going up and down, up and down, but instead they're being deflected around the planet in sort of a diagonal fashion. And how are those basically um, staggered is shown over here. So at the equator, we have these winds that are traveling from the northeast towards the equator. And over here, we have these winds over here south of the equator traveling from the southeast towards the equator. So these are known as trade winds but you can perhaps just know them from the location that they're going towards. So um, this right here might just be considered an easterly, and this is considered a westerly, and these are considered easterlies, and so on and so forth. Just as a kind of side note, the winds are named for the direction they're coming from. So easterlies are coming from the east, whereas westerlies are coming from the west. So that's something that you, you should keep an eye on also and just think about, because the winds, like I said, they're coming, they're named after the direction they're coming from, not the direction that they're going. So easterlies come from the east, and they're probably traveling towards the west or somewhere else. Westerlies are coming from the west, and they're most likely heading east, and they're going in whatever direction. Um, so think about this again. The direction of the winds is named after where they originate. Keep that in mind. And then finally, one thing to just perhaps know about prevailing winds is know this diagram. If you can replicate this diagram, I think you will 
be more than ready for any type of prevailing wind question. So I hope that was a little bit clear. Um, this is a very tricky topic to sort of explain, and I know I don't do the best job of, of explaining this topic. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments, feel free to ask your professor or your TFs or your learning assistants, and I hope you found this video useful, and best of luck studying, and I'll see you in the next video.